pay no attention to the cobwebs. <laughs> I just tweeted it out with a shout out to your podcast. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that. Very cool. Yeah, well, I see. We... When I... No, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I just say whenever I start my spaces, I'm usually chatting by myself to fill in the gap time between the time where you start it and the time there's enough people in the audience. <laughs> you, know what? So, you know what? You know what? What's interesting about this particular space is that we're going to be doing a bunch of them. This is the first one that I'm officially hosting. Though I've, I've, I've hosted hundreds and hundreds of podcast episodes or whatever. This is my first time hosting a Twitter space. So we'll see how it goes. Be gentle. No way. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, That's but somebody funny. who works in audio is the first time I'm, I'm <laughs> in here. Have yeah. you done Clubhouse Usually, before? You, what's, yeah, yeah, I've been in Clubhouse, but I've never hosted a Clubhouse either. You know, I kind of oh, missed that boat. Funny. <laughs> This, so this, is, this, is your, podcasting. this is your Genesis <laughs> Genesis drop, you know. There you this go. is this is my hello world right here. So. <laughs> well, there's a lot uh, of tricks to it. I think, like just bring up people, and when do you bring up people? And you know, I uh, it's it's a very it's interesting. It's all live, so you got to figure out how to manage people in terms of the audience and get people in, and how to get people in the door. So. Wait a minute. It's, oh, wait, wait. You're saying this is live? This is not recorded? What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you mean I have to edit myself before I say something? I can't do it in post? Uh, or not edit yourself. <laughs> you can go either way. Uh, yeah, exactly. No, this is going to be good. I think it's this is uh, refreshing. Like, normally, like I said, normally I'm doing podcast, not formal, because my, my style of podcasting is very conversational and formal. Um, but, you know, taking it down a notch from even that informalness, you know, and just having a normal peer to peer conversation is exciting. So I'm, I'm interested to see how this goes. It should be fun. Yeah, it should be fun. I mean, it should be good. Yeah. I mean, he got, got some good topics on lined up. I think you're in some ways much more organized than ever. I, I am ever organized, but pretty much <laughs> off the cuff, sort of trying to, you know, ask questions and things come up. Um, but, uh, yeah. but you got, you got me and Dap, so we're, yeah. we're here so as your we, targets. I say we, I say we dive in. You guys are, you know, we've established that you know I'm severely unqualified to be hosting a Twitter space <laughs> with you guys, <laughs> but I'm going to do the best I can. <laughs> so, uh, well, you know what? Let's dive in. So this this is a, a Light Dot Art Twitter space. This is the first one in a series that we're we're going to be doing. Uh, that I'm luckily going to be hosting if I do a good job on this one. I'm thinking. Uh, but it's, you know, the, with, when uh, Dap and I were having an initial conversation about what this might look like, it was what we didn't want to have was a, just a long, drawn out conversation on yet another platform that wasn't really substantive, you know. So we, we decided why not why not really not laser focus the topics, but loosely focus the topics around something that I can then guide the conversation around kind of like a lattice work for a vine and then you know, kind of see how that goes and then put a put a time block on it. That's why we're calling this the light hour instead of it being, you know, three, four, five hours of people, you know, eating dinner and all that. Why not just keep it concise and to the point? So that was the genesis of this particular Twitter space, which will be hopefully, if all goes well, rec be reoccurring every Tuesday and Thursday at 5 p.m. U.S. Pacific time. So we'll see how that goes. So with that, that's a, that's enough of that out of the way what this thing is going to be about. The next thing I want to do is just a quick round table introductions and then we're just going to chat. So I'm Frederick Van Johnson. I'm the host of a podcast called This Week in Photo. It's at thisweekinphoto.com and on socials. And I've been doing that for several years now and I am now, you know, adding Twitter spaces to the to the queue of things that we publish on and this is a great way to start it. But yeah, host this week in photo, photographer, been a photographer for a long time, since technically 1989, I've been taking professional photos. So, you know, know my way around the photos, I'm learning my way around all this other stuff that we're going to be talking to, talking about tonight. And I get to talk to interesting people like, like Dap and Chikai. So Chikai, I want to throw it to you. Can you give us a quick introduction, like who you are and what's your, what's your quick origin story? 
Uh, sure. So uh, <laughs> I guess I'll give my origin story within the NFT space. I just only started collecting uh, NFTs or even art in general for the past yeah. year, maybe a little over a year ago, um, and sort of bought some just uh, for fun. And then it went down deep, deep down the rabbit hole. Uh, and so I, I did not anticipate being where I am right now in terms of both just how much I'm part of the community. You know, I, I, I always thought I'd just be a bystander watching what's happening, but that did not happen. I, I definitely got pulled in very deep uh, and very thankful to everybody who is in the community who's been warm and receptive and sort of, uh, you know, just uh, just welcome me in. Uh, but initially I wasn't very much into photography. I was very much into more 3D, abstract 3D, uh, more of the 3D sort of animated type stuff. But then uh, sometime this summer, around August, when the photography collection sort of kicked off, I got heavy into photography. So that's sort of how I, you know, sort of met Daph after he bought the, uh, um, uh, uh, Omar's piece and then sort of connected actually in real life, which is kind of crazy to think that, you know, especially mm -hmm. for a collector, uh, especially a collector who's like basically a non to actually meet them in real life is highly unusual. Uh, so, yeah. but, uh, but before that I did Google earth and Google maps and stuff for many years in the tech uh, side of the world. And that's where most of my background is, is in that uh, area. Thanks. Excellent. Excellent. Cool. That's a good summary. There's a bunch of things I want to chat about there. One of them, is that community aspect of all this this NFT crypto world? So we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit later. Dap, what about you? So give us give us your origin story, your your radioactive spider bit you on the hand story. How'd you get here? Sure. So um, similar to Chikai, I also started on NFTs um, basically early in 2021. Um, and for me, you know, I had I had been looking at crypto from a very intellectual standpoint for you know ever since pretty much the Bitcoin paper came out. Uh, I never really got into it um, until NFTs came out. Uh, was really, I think, sort of the, the aha moment for me. I was like, well, this is a really cool tech. I think it's it's really something that could change uh, change the world for the better. It's actually a use case for the blockchain that I that I can see, right, that I can think about. And so I write, write in, sort of uh, jumped in, and um, I, I got got in my start through the CryptoPunks community. So I, you know, I got a CryptoPunk and I uh, uh, started sort of, you know, through that, uh, getting to know projects. I got into generative art. So I started uh, collecting some art blocks um, early on. And then, uh, you know, over time, um, I wanted to do my own project. We started uh, another project called Area, uh, which um, we ended up um, pivoting into what is now Light. So Light became a, uh, which is a photography um, publisher. It was sort of a, a offshoot of area. We we started doing light, and then we realized that that's where all the traction was. That's where all the interest was, um, and so we decided to to basically focus on this. And now I'm full time Web three working on on light. Um, and uh, my previous life uh, was in uh, mostly in finance. So I worked in different um, in investment banks in Wall Street, but I also have. Uh, Spent a couple of years doing a startup around 10 years ago. Um, so I've had some experience in tech for, for a while. So, Frederick, I, I am I am pinning tweets. If you don't know how to do that, which is maybe your first time, if you browse around, you can pick a tweet, and then when you share it, you can say pin to the, uh, to the conversations. I just pinned the, this week in photo for you. And Shikai, you didn't talk about monolith. You should pin that in there as well. Huh? Oh, I will. I will. I think Frederick may be muted. That's why we can't hear him. Maybe he thinks he's being heard, but he's muted. Yeah, I'm over here raving because I just learned how to pin tweets, and you didn't hear a word I said. <laughs> so there. You go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome! Thank you, thank you for that, Shikai. I appreciate that. Every little bit helps. You know, this is this is yeah. this whole episode. This whole episode is my first episode of all time. We should make this episode an NFT. So we got to record it and, and sell it in 20 years, see if we can make some money. <laughs> um, let, uh, let's, let's switch. So the main, the main topic of this conversation, like I was saying, is the curation side of things, right? And I want to I dive into that first. And I'll, I'll set the stage, and then we just, you know, bounce stuff off the wall, you know, open-ended conversation. So... Part of the part of the framing of the conversation, I think, is 
when you're when you're dealing with an entity or a company that is saying that they are curating imagery for a certain purpose or for a certain audience versus the people that are acting as let's let's call them gatekeepers right where they are the the bouncer outside of the club that you're trying to get into and through some arbitrary set of rules that person is making the decision on if you're cool enough or not to go in that club the night you know that night for whatever reasons curation versus gatekeeping in the nft world chikai i want to i want to throw it to you first where where do you fall on that you know when you when you're looking at the whole world of the you know collecting these things or even on the creation side where does curation fit in with gatekeeping are they the same thing or are they different um i think for me and this is me coming from a non-art world background i think there's a lot of people that i have a lot of respect for that have come from that traditional art background uh and uh they've you know they have seen what it's like and there's a lot of things they want to bring over yet there's some things they want to leave behind like gatekeeping um but uh i think that for me uh and this is coming again this may be naive but this also just comes from my sort of uh approach and how i came into sort of the nft world slash art world is that i want to redefine curation because every time i brought up curation in my conversations people often associated it with gatekeeping like you said uh and i think i wanted to redefine the word curation to not mean gatekeeping like it was in the traditional art world but to mean being an advocate, now advocacy. So you're Mm -hmm. advocating for the artist. um, And because of the sort of structure of NFTs, everybody wins in the end. The collector wins. I mean, if you do the commissions right, you know, the the curator could win. uh, And then the artist wins because they get royalties every time it's sold. So there's this very great sort of economic sort of incentive that allow everybody to win in the end. And so I want to change that word meaning um to mean being an advocate versus being a gatekeeper uh and that'll take time and i think i could for me it's being doing it by example and i, I forgot to mention in my quick bio as dap sort of mentioned that um i started something called monolith gallery which is like an open curation platform uh to sort of push forward that concept that one curation is valuable and two i want to change the definition of it to be being an advocate uh, and then uh, three, eventually, I want to show that it can be uh, a respected profession that you can make money doing it uh, in this world. And hopefully, you know, the, the best curators in the world will make millions. And, you know, the, the, the good curators will make a living. Uh, so I think that's my hope for it. But that, it's, a, it's a long road to get there. But I'm trying to lead by example in that particular case. But if we're if we're in this world where, you know, let's call it we're at the beginning of the earth cooling, right, in terms of people understanding NFTs and the possibilities and, you know, let alone the underlying blockchain layer and all that. Right. If we're kind of at the earth is cooling part of that, just understanding the thing, you know, and what its benefits are, how far are we away from people getting to the nuance of, you know, particularly artists getting to the, the nuance of understanding the curation versus the gatekeeping thing. If they're just looking at it, like this is just a matrix level of numbers and possibilities and I'm afraid. And now there's this gatekeeping thing. I don't know. Either one of you guys, what do you think? How do you, how do, where are we on that scale of going from, yes, this is ready. And people are, you know, it's it, like, like, like Chikai is saying, you know, it's trustworthy. We should, we should be able to move forward under this new modality or sit on the sidelines and be, you know, wait for it to wait for the storm to go by what do you guys think uh, um go ahead go ahead Dan. and I'll, I'll jump it afterwards i'm sorry okay yeah sh- sure no because I, I wanted to also talk a little bit about the first question too together with this one which is uh, in my view in my view i think that the technology kills the gatekeeping right that's sort of how i think about it so um we you know and, and the analogy i use is sort of news right so before the internet you know you could you could only publish news through through gatekeepers, if you will, right? Through public, through editors in the newspapers, et cetera. And then technology came, and it's like now everybody's a publisher, right? And mm-hmm. so the, the the sort of the gates are off, right? And actually, then the problem becomes the positive side of curation, which is how do you sift through sift through all this, right? And figure out which news to publish. And it's the same thing in the NFT world is sort of, you know, now everybody can publish directly to the collectors, right? As a, as an artist trying to sell your art. Um, 
and and then the challenge in this world of abundance then becomes how do you filter all that right and 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 in my view sort of that is perhaps the biggest question of our time right like how do you how do you filter things in a world where technology allows you to sort of you know uh, gives us this abundance of information abundance of content abundance of work right and that's where curation becomes so important and and you can't really avoid it um in a way and the way you know often ends up happening is the algorithms curate for you right so your twitter mm-hmm. feed is you know i mean elon musk just told everybody you know stop using the twitter algo just use the use the, the 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 sort of the timeline as it is right um mm-hmm. and and i think with when it comes to nft we're in the early stages of that which is you know, we don't even have algorithms yet other than the Twitter one, right? Actually, the Twitter algorithm is kind of curating NFTs right now, right? So and you see all these photographers trying to game it, uh, you know, and trying to, like, figure out how to get their work shown through Twitter. Um, and I think what, you know, that stage is still very early. And I think, you know, uh, curation will become, you know, both will come both from a you know, better discovery, from a kind of technological algorithm standpoint, but also the human curation of that right and that's i think we're starting to see efforts like ours efforts like uh, what shikai is doing uh which is trying to bring in the human component to that and and um, and i think it's even more exciting than than in the news case because what happened in news you you had these old institutions that did that right so the new york times and they survived a lot of smaller newspapers ended up dying right but in nft there is none right so there is no curator if you will uh, to begin with, and so we're 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 starting to see all of these new initiatives to create, um, you know, filters for this amazing technology that that is allowing everyone to publish. But yeah, that, that's yeah. where I want to I want to kind of nail that with both of you, uh, and then and then Shikai, I want to talk. I would definitely would dive in more on the monolith gallery project that you're working on. When you would when we look at this stuff from uh, you know through the yes, technology is egalitarian. And ultimately, it'll be the algorithm doing the curation and the, you know, the best of the best will ride, ride to the surface naturally and vice versa for the worst of the worst. But who's writing the algorithms, right? So on, on that side of it, how do we, you know, from a futurist, both of you guys put on your futurist hats, right? From a futurist standpoint, looking, standing in the future, looking back on where we are now, what should you, how would you advise today, today's version of you to be moving so that, this this you know future of sort of equal curation or gatekeeping is a non-issue i don't know what, what do you guys think yeah i mean i think that i mean in terms of the future in terms of algorithms um the thing that i just wanted to, to frame that is is to what dap said which is at the very beginning of nfts there weren't that many artists and uh, there were maybe some some collectors and stuff around and it was a time maybe a year ago where you could just drop something and someone would just buy it. <laughs> like mm-hmm. there was no, you didn't have to do anything. Like when Foz just like dropped his thing, like he dropped it and then someone bought it. It was just like crazy that that was possible because it was such a, such a small area. It's like when Google, when you first Google did uh, like ads, like if you put an ad up for whatever it was, you were the only bidder you would make so much money because the ROI was insane because nobody can was competing against you in terms of the, the ad space that was on Google. So I, I remember stories of like people would in the very, very early days, they would just spend it and it'd be so cheap. And the ROI would be amazing because they would find people that want to buy, you know, whatever they were selling books or whatever it's going to be. So yeah. the same case for art, as more art comes online uh, and more artists come online to NFTs, there's going to be more art to look through. So as that grows, how do you sort through it? Because you can't look at every single one. It's, a, it's, it's an unreasonable task to ask any collector to do, say, look at all the art and then pick one that you want to buy that day or whatever it's going to be. So you need something to help you sort through that because no average person is going to do that. Uh, and so the two ways you can go is one is, is human curation. And you can almost think about it as like Yahoo directory. Or it can be algorithms, which is like Google search, you know, you know, sort of Facebook's algorithms, Twitter's algorithms, so forth. And at that scale, you know, algorithms tend to be the more economical way to do it. Um, mm-hmm. And so, but my future that I want to see is, is, and this is specific to one-on-one art. This is not necessarily my vision for like, you know, for like PFPs or gaming or music, or there's a lot of different categories, NFT, but specifically for one-on-one art, 
Um, I don't want an algorithm. I don't want an algorithm to tell me what to buy or what I like. I, I, just, I just wouldn't trust it because it's such a subjective, very human perception thing that I do not think an algorithm could get right and I wouldn't trust it. Uh, and so I want a future for my one-on-one -on -one art to not have an algorithm, but have humans, a network of humans curating that work. And so if you want that future to happen, you have to one value people in those roles and then you have to compensate people in those roles so they can actually make a living out of doing it. And so those are the two key things I'm trying to push towards over the next, I would say years. It's going to take time to do it. Um, for at least for that one small segment of the NFT market to to value people in the curational role. Otherwise, you're going to have, if you don't want a curator, quote unquote gatekeeper, uh, in the old sense, then something something else will come in to, to take that role. Because that's a problem that, that will need to be fixed. Um, that is so, want... that's prophetic from the from the standpoint of, you know, I remember back in the day I was at when I first joined Yahoo back in the day, I remember on day one, you know, they escort you to your desk and show you your cubicle and here's the restroom and all that stuff. I remember going by the part of Yahoo um, back when they were on, they were still in Sunnyvale. The uh, there was a whole section of a floor set aside for searchers and people that were basically building the Yahoo directory, kind of like what you're saying, Sky. You know, the whole yep. these are hu human curators that are looking at websites and making the determination. You know, if that website is worthy enough through some set of rules. I don't know what their rules were. Um, if that website was worthy enough to be listed in the directory. From the external standpoint, no one knew. I didn't know about that before I got in there. Of course, they ultimately changed to full-on algorithm, like Google, of course. But back in the day, there were humans there filling out the database every single day and making those determinations. So those were the gatekeepers. And then ultimately, the algorithm, you know, or going the algorithm route proved to be, obviously, this is the way to go and the only way to scale, et cetera. I wonder if we're seeing... We're going to see some semblance of that in this space. I don't know. Dap, what, what do you Yeah, I, I hope not, honestly. I want it to be decentralized uh, in terms of the curation. But Dap, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I was just going to say, th this sounds like a really sad story, right? Because we're, if we're, you know, if we're going to see the future, what happened to Yahoo then? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, but, but uh, you know, I think the other analogy is Wikipedia, right? I think, which is nobody usually talks about their curation, but... Um, you know, it actually arguably works the best of all the social media that we have, right? We only talk about usually Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. And, you know, people generally trust Wikipedia content and there are humans behind it, right? But it's still open. So, you know, anybody can go yes. there and, and, and edit. The key thing and, is it's, it's right? open and it's also quote unquote decentralized. There's no one entity, a corporate entity controlling it. So that's the hope. And I think Super Rare is definitely pushing down that uh, that down that road with Super Rare Spaces, and I like that concept. And I think there's an even bigger concept to sort of push out there. But I do think before even we get to that point, I think I want to establish the value of curation. I don't know if mm -hmm. people uh, see the value of it uh, yet uh, to have a well curated set of stuff and what that means. Uh, and that's because once they know the value, then people will want it. But I, I just want to establish value because I, I don't know if people see it yet. Uh, but I think they will once they see it. And what's a flow, Shai? What's a, what's a, a you know, a, kind of a, a life cycle of a piece of art that is finished? Let's call it a well-known artist, you know, that finishes this piece of art and creates an NFT from it and feels like it's worth X. Then what? Like, where where should that piece of art go through a curation process, wherever, where, where should it go in order to get the best life it possibly can get? So I think, you know, in that respect, you think about, you know, in the old world, you have a piece of art, you, you throw it out there and you do some gallery or we'll pick it up and, they, and then it, they do their thing. Uh, in the case of NFTs, which I think is the beauty of it, and it's also, it's, it's a double-edged sword when, when this happens, which is, the creator, the artist is in control. They can list it at whatever price they want to, list it wherever they want to, and do and promote it however way they want to. It is fully in their control. They don't need a gallery, a physical space. They don't need to get a credit card thing. It's all built in. They just got to list it somewhere. And they can even do their own contract if they want to, but they can also list it on a platform. 
it doesn't matter. They're in full control. But they also mean that they have the responsibility to get their stuff noticed and get it mm-hmm. out there. And so that's where it becomes instead of a like what do I do next and what who do I need to involve. It's like I think the way you look at it, at least in the decentralized world, is there's all these nodes, there's all these different artists and collectors and builders and so forth. And what you want to do to make a strong decentralized network is not everybody go to one node and say, okay, help me distribute my work. You want to create multiple connections. You want to create multiple links in the network. The more links each person has, the stronger the network becomes. And so you want to say partner and collaborate with these curators or these builders or these whatever to help you uh, sort of get visibility by having these authentic human connections because uh, people trust me they'll reach out to me and say okay can you help me out and you know it, everybody starts helping each other and that's mm-hmm. the way i think it should be looked at versus a particular path to here's here's there here's the the checks you have to go through to get to whatever to, to the to the get your gallery your piece listed but it's a much chaotic way to go about it because there is no direct way to do it but I think if you can establish those human connections with a, a diverse set of people within the community, long term, you will do well because you will have people shouting from the rooftops for your success. It will be fellow artists, collectors, builders, and hopefully curators uh, to help do that. And I think that my hope is, especially for the curational role, there's an economic incentive starting to be built into platforms to allow those people to participate in the economic outcomes like collectors and artists are currently today. Yeah, I love that. Well, well said. And, and Dap, I want to have you chime in on that since you are in, you're in that position of, you know, being able to be at that, you know, sort of guide what Shikai is talking about in terms of establishing the narrative for the, uh, you know, the next generation of curation. Where do you fall on this? And, you know, especially to put a finer point on it, that, you know, leaning towards human or atom-based you know, curation versus electron or AI-based curation? Where, where do you fall on that? Yeah, so for me, I, I sort of think of curation as, as another form of storytelling, right? Um, and I'm going to go back to the news analogy because I think we've seen the cycle play out with, with the news technology, right? Um, so you have, you know, stuff happens every day, right? Like different events, right? Then you people tweet about it, the wires pick up, right? So that was, I don't know, today there was a bomb in the Ukraine, right? Or something like a, a bombing, right? Or, or an attack. And yeah. all that stuff is happening all the time. And people are creating these pieces of news, very optimized pieces of news that create like, you know, through different nodes and everybody reads it. And then somebody at the end of the day says, okay, this is the news of the day, right? So they aggregate, they create sort of a story. And then you have weekly magazines, right? So you pick up The Economist, for example. They may summarize what is the situation over the last week or the developments, right? And then at some point, somebody's going to write a book and it's going to be you know, the story of the war in Ukraine, right? And it's going to be kind of a longer story about all of those little things that have happened, right? And I think with art, it's a little bit similar too, right? So you go and you do your drop, right? You drop one image, or maybe you do a collection, right? And you're sending information into that space, right? And through different nodes, as Shikai said, I completely agree with this. And at some point, you know, someone, maybe even yourself, right? Writing about your own story, but somebody may write a story about you in your body of work, right? And that's curation, right? It's not just the picking the images or pick, it's also kind of contextualized, right? So this is what this artist is, this is what they're saying, right? Yep. And and then also, like, you know, in a bigger context is how does this mean, what does this mean in terms of the entire space for NFTs, right? Or what does it mean within art and, and, and in the culture that we're building together, right, as a civilization? So I think there's all these layers of curation and storytelling. And curation is a little bit about synthesizing and, and sifting through, right, as we say, um, all of these different nodes and kind of, you know, making some, some, making some sense out of this. Right. So for example, yeah. in our, just to, to answer your question about what we're doing, right. Mm-hmm. So we're creating a, a, an annual collection and we, we, so the cadence of this collection for, for, for light is going to be annual because of that. Cause we're trying to say, okay, we're going to capture every year kind of what, what is the space at? And like a, a snapshot of that space. It's not going to cover everything, but 
at least as we see it, right? And the good, what is good in that space during that period. And the next year it will be different because it'll be a different year. There'll be different things and there'll be a different story around that, right? So it's the, it's the, the same type of idea of sort of long form storytelling about everything that is going on with art in, in the space. That was a, that's a good segue because the next thing I was going to bring up was, was that with the whole idea of time and curation of these NFTs in the zeitgeist of what's going on in the world at that time. You know, it may be, you know, if you look back in time, especially if you look at Adobe and they've been releasing their stock photography report for, I don't know, at least half a decade or more now. And every year they have people that go out and basically see what the world is feeling, right? What does the world feel creatively? What are dominant colors? Is it fear because of this, you know, pandemic going on? Is it optimism because of this thing? What are the colors that represent that? What are what are even the fonts that we're seeing used uh, a lot during this past year and why, right? So they're they're looking at it from that standpoint. And I overlay that on this whole space or this conversation of curation and NFTs, like the curators that we're talking about, like you just said, like what Light's doing, the curators have to be plugged into that, right? So they have to, for me, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling this out myself, but it seems to me that the curators need to be plugged in bi-directionally. So they need to be plugged into the zeitgeist of what's going on on the planet and to what the collector market is feeling collectively and come to a happy medium when they when they're curating a piece to be entered into a certain collection does that make sense or is that over overthinking it what do you guys think yeah that's an interesting dynamic you're talking about in terms of the relation of the curator versus the uh the collector and making sure that those mm -hmm. two match and it's, it's been that's definitely from a very much a market standpoint like will they find a market for it and so yeah. i think there are two different styles of curation uh, that I think we need to sort of look at. Um, and I think it's interesting because they already exist in the traditional art world and they have two very different sort of motives for that. Uh, and I think that they also play on this one. I'm actually playing with both of those in parallel at the same time. Uh, but the two one are in the traditional art world, there is curation in a, a museum institution like uh, SFMOMA or MOMA or whatever it's going to be. And then there's curation at somewhere like Sotheby's. Uh, and those two styles of curation are very different because the end goal is is different. One is to sell a piece of art and one is to sort of capture, the, like I said, the zeitgeist, the historical moments of these artists and to make sure you have a history of what's happening and, 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 and having in the permanent collection some of these seminal artists in the field. Uh, and, and, and so it's a very different lens by which to curate. Uh, I've been... I mean, I just actually met with a, one of the, the curators at SF Memo a few weeks ago, and it was just fascinating to hear her process of how they do it. It's a much longer time frame, and they're looking on the scale, a much larger scale in terms of time re relative to what artists are doing, and their relationships are years in the making versus just like they look at it and look at and go buy it or put into the into the uh, SF Memo uh, permanent collection. So I think those are two different ones. And so I think that, the Monolith Gallery site for me, if you go to monolith.gallery, it's an open curation. Anybody can curate. And my goal is to bring to light in that sense. It's a curation of so, a, a diverse and wide set of art forms and artists and international aspects to make sure that we cover, I cover, or you know, Monolith Gallery covers uh, a, a very good perspective, a diverse perspective of the world. It's not just art from the U.S., art from Europe or, or wherever it's going to be. It is all over the world. It's not just photography, but it's just whatever is out there. And so awesome. that is the goal for that one. The other one is in Monolith Gallery Space, which is on Super Air Space, which are, I am actually selling on the Super Air platform. And so I'm curating stuff for the purpose of selling that piece of art. Uh, and so that has a very different sort of viewpoint in that one. And so for the former with the Monolith Gallery site, it is very much in line with, with that punk. I did not know how I was going to do my curational style for that, but I think the core thing I'm looking for is a story. It it's a, could be a simple story. It could be a long story. There has to be a story. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the key element because that's what how we connect. That's how we share our history. That's how we share our traditions. That's how we share you know, who we are through stories. 
and you want to connect yeah. people through those stories um, in a way that makes sense. Like there's one curation that Chris Graves did. His intro was maybe 10, it was like a haiku, <laughs> but it was, it was very well written and very much illustrative of the, of the set that he created from his body of work. But then there are other ones who wrote like three or four paragraphs of stuff to explain their personal history before they introduced their work. And so, it, but the, the key is a story. And it could be a po poetic uh, version of your story, or it could be a long sort of more historical narrative of the story. Um, but the, the, I think there are two different ones in terms of, and I, I don't know how they match necessarily, but I don't think we need, we, sh need, we need to or should sort of merge the two. They, they could be independent and run in parallel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with, with Monolith Gallery, um, you said anyone can curate in there. How does that, how does that work? And that, that, that goes to one of the questions I was going to throw at you guys was, is, the, is true curation inherently crowdsourced? Right. So, you know, it, on the on the whole topic of zeitgeist and all that is or is there a component of curation that that should be crowdsourced? You know, maybe not the whole thing, but a piece of it. But I don't know. You know, how, how does that how does that work, Shikai, over there with the curation and monolith? Um, so the reason why I did an open curation, because I thought about initially just curating myself and I thought this is going to be so much work. <laughs> <laughs> for me to go out and find them i like i need help and like i didn't want to hire a team of people because i could i mean i, I wasn't there just to i just wanted to get it out there and i thought oh why don't if i just made it open like anybody can curate and the only thing that is you've got to own it or have created the nft and that's it and you can curate it uh and that was and i thought that was allowed it to be much more open because i think curation if you look in the traditional art world not everybody can be a curator um for you know just because one it's a very it's a specific job and you have to sort of work your way into it. And it's, it's a sort of a closed sort of group of people. Um, and it costs money to open a gallery. Like even if you wanted to own your own gallery and carry your own set of artists to then sell within your gallery, it takes a fair amount of capital to do that. But in the NFT world, it's, it's near, it's no cost more than a website to do that. Uh, you can curate, anybody can curate and set up their own virtual gallery on, on cyber or build their own site or whatever. And it's the cost is significantly lower and so it just opens that up to anybody. And so I wanted to make curation not just for the select few, but I want it to be open to anybody. And right now, interestingly enough, it's not the curators of the traditional art world that are those type of people that are curating. It is artists curating their own work. It is a way for them to tell their story, to put it out there. And that's 90 plus percent of the people who are curating right now. There are a few collectors, and I think that more collectors will come in over time. I, I think there's so few of them right now. And and also that those few, they need to have a desire to want to curate. But I think part of it is just showing the value of curation and saying they want to do it because every time I've curated my stuff within a gallery, I'm like it made me appreciate what I had. And I think there needs to be this idea of not just buying the next new piece of art, but appreciating and contemplating and sort of sitting with what you have. So some people have some incredible, incredible collections that I, that just don't see the light of day because nobody looks through them and curates them and appreciates them and, and puts them together in a way that creates a great context and story around it. To say, this is why, you know, I'm not thinking on Omar because I see him right there on my screen or Scott, not there. this is why their work is amazing. Uh, you know, this is why they have a unique place in history uh, and, and, taking that time takes a lot of effort, uh, but also takes the jump of saying there's value there. So it's worth that effort. Um, so but I, I sort of went on a tangent a little bit, but hopefully it answered your question. No, it's good. No, that's, that's good. I, I wanted to throw it over to, to Dap as well on the whole, you know, the crowdsourced curation piece of this, right? Is, is, there, is there room for you know, just globally crowdsourced curation, or should it should it be more private and more selective? Um, I mean, I think we sort of what we were talking about with regards to like Wikipedia, for example, as I mentioned. I think you know you do have a role for open. Uh, I think it's very important to have open curation, and and uh, but then you know, I think what what Shikai is, is describing is sort of 
anybody can curate now also creates another problem right we got to curate the curators now <laughs> right uh, yeah it's, it's which is, right? yeah <laughs> so so it's sort of you know again it goes back to the f- sort of how do you filter things but i think in terms of the, the idea that you're talking about like how do you relate to the collectors or to the zeitgeist right and i think that is key because if you see curation as another form of storytelling you go to this idea of like well if you curate in the middle of the woods and nobody sees it did you really curate at all, right? <laughs> on the other hand, exactly. <laughs> on the other hand, <laughs> <laughs> that's a t-shirt. You're a t-shirt machine. To have a <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, but then on, 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 on the other hand, you know, if you're just kind of giving people, you know, sort of what they want, right. Then you're just going to be curating pictures of cats, right. Cause we know that's what does well online. Right. Uh, uh, or babies. I don't know. Right. So you, you have to, there's this, this, this role of the curator, which is, you know, understanding the audience, right. And all of the story that they're telling with our curation and, and having an impact on that audience by staking a stand as well. Right. So this is what, you know, given what I know about my audience and this, this is given like how I want to make a change and influence the world of my curation. This is kind of what I'm going to propose. And sometimes that means pushing some boundaries Sometimes that means risking just curating in the woods, right? And it's similar when you put a piece of art out, right? You could, you could put a piece of art just for, for its own sake. You, know, you don't care if it's going to sell or not. Uh, but then, you know, I think there are some artists also think, well, I want my art, to, my art to speak, but then also to have an impact, right? And so you need to think about the audience as well. Uh, and that's, yeah. that's the interesting conversation. Yeah, I want to yeah. talk about that more, the whole, the whole intent side. Uh, Shikai, you're going you're gonna to say something? No, I just think about the word crowdsource. I think that I think it's less crowdsource and more democratization to provide accessibility and that anybody can curate. Because I do think curation, at least for traditional art world, is was a very, you know, a closed sort of group of people who could do it. And those closed group of people were determining what was good art or not what would go in institutions and go in the permanent archives or be displayed in galleries. So I like the idea of opening up to anybody can do it. Uh, and so that we have a much broader voice and diverse voice of people to show what amazing stuff is out there. So otherwise, it will just start to. I don't, there's so much more art out there than I think is being shown and recognized within the current art galleries, the traditional art world. And that's why I like the open nature of it. So you're you're allowing access to it. You're not necessarily crowdsourcing it like Wikipedia. You all contribute to form this one thing, but you're but each person has ability to then you know, sort of go off and create a curation. There's nothing stopping them uh, except, you know, find the audience and, and, and putting it out there. So I think it's more democratization than crowdsourcing. It's the only nuance I want to put out there. Yeah, yeah. It goes to trust, too. You know, and, and Shikai, you're in a, a, a unique position, I would say, to, to speak on this whole issue when you look at crowdsourcing through the lens of, you know, a mapping-type architecture, right? So on the one hand, you you know you have a certain amount of map data that describes an area but on the other hand you can incorporate crowdsource data in that to make that you know let's call it you know binary data more colorful right so you could put in things that that are happening spur of the moment or whatever into that data does it does it enrich the data on you know is it better to have a black and white like to overlay that into the creative world does it, is it better to have a black and white assessment or an AI type in se- assessment of a particular image? And then on top of that, maybe have some crowdsourced, touchy feely, subjectivity, zeitgeist type opinion on top of that? Or is it just better, like you're saying, to go the complete opposite route and have real humans that have real feelings and real opinions? make a judgment on whether this thing is worthy for X, Y, Z or not, or is it a hybrid of the two? What, what do you think? I definitely go to the latter. It's like, it has to be humans to start with because mm-hmm. art is for humans. <laughs> there is no black or white. <laughs> hey, I have an gray. Android friend that would argue with you, man. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is very, very, I mean, you could, you know, it could be, you know, a, sentient beings everyone would call it like like it it, it is a very human uh thing i think art is uh and so i want at least i would want a future where it's a network of humans that are determining and again i'm very specific to be the one-on-one art world this this i don't necessarily is true for 
PFPs or gaming or music or every other particular sort of um, variation of this NFT world. Uh, but for one on one art, uh, at least which is I when I care about most, is the stuff that if everything went to nothing and all I own was the JPEG and the N and the relationship with the artist, I'd be happy. Uh, I mean, I would have thought I thought this whole thing, whole experiment would have been amazing because I got to meet these incredible artists and have incredible relationship with them, and I own their piece of art. Um, and so, if it went to zero price, I'd still be happy. Uh, I'm not, the, I realize I'm not the common sort of case. I mean, people do look at it as an investment and I respect that. And it's part of the nature of what makes this whole thing work. Cause you have to have some speculation in the, in the market to, to make it work. Uh, but I'm definitely here for different reasons. And I'm hoping that long-term vision helps keep the ecosystem going and realize the dream you'll have about NFTs and actually have it happen. There's no guarantee it's going to happen. We hope this is going to happen because there's an incredible amount of work that's going to happen to make that happen, to make it a reality. And I think curation is going to be a critical element, at least in my vision of the future, because I want humans to be part of the sorting through all the art than, than not, not computers doing it. I don't want a computer to sort of do it. Even though I have a, a very deep background in, in sort of the tech <laughs> world, I don't want that part to be part of the selection process for art. Because uh, I know which what it makes is, you an authority, right? <laughs> that makes you an authority having that background. So we were listening. <laughs> oh, so I just, I just want to. Uh, so first of all, I agree with with what you guys saying, but I think it's important to to just touch upon why people don't like necessarily human curation, right? At, sort of at its core, and I think you know we talked about the gatekeeping and you know kind of uh, the issues that we have in traditional art world world in terms of accessibility, but there's also another element to that, which is transparency and conflicts of interest and kind of shenanigans, right? And I think whenever you have a human process, people might have issue with trusting that process, that it's a fair process, right? And um, I think that's why a lot of people tend to favor more rules-based, whether it's algorithm or another method, because, you know, it seems to be, cleaner right or it seems to be more free of uh of biases or whatever and that's not necessarily always true either but at least it creates something that seems like a level playing field right so i think it's a responsibility also for curators who end up in positions where they have an influence right to have that transparency and that objectivity and to create a process that is fair right and um for example you know one of the things we've tried to do with our process is you know, the curators um, receive the images and the curation without knowing who the artist is behind it, right? Uh, and in, in addition to that, we also have them disclose if they have any relationship with that artist. So, you know, as a separate list, okay, here are the list of artists that we're submitting. You know, do you have any conflicts? Like, do you collect them already? Or, you know, is your wife or whatever, right? Or are you close friends? So then there is that element of, okay, if you are, somewhat conflicted you should excuse yourself from from that process right and so j just wanted to to, to to make that point that you know if we're going to have human curation to be careful about all the potential pitfalls of that and address them rather than sort of not even talking about it right? no yeah. i agree yeah um yeah i, I think that you know, I think that's an, a very interesting point that will become more and more of an issue as the space grows bigger and bigger. Because I think right now it's small enough that you're pretty transparent and, and there's less of a, I mean, it's, it's you're not like a tastemaker. Like the influencers and stuff, they could just say, they can make or break somebody sometimes. They get big enough. Like like if you have insane number of followers, just a little bit of, attention to somebody could make or break that artist. Uh, and I think that that dynamic becomes more pronounced the bigger the space gets uh, and, the, and the bigger the audience for a particular sort of uh, person in, in the community gets. And so that's when you have to, you know, sort of, you know, you have to be careful. You have to be careful what's their true intent and how transparent mm -hmm. are they. So if you can't tell what their intent is and you don't see them being very transparent, then you have to have some wary eye on it and that's been true for a lot of pfp projects or even you know even other projects that are out there like uh you have to be careful about you know how much they're you know sort of trying to push away fud or sort of like 
be very much, you know, only talking about bullish things about their projects to make people believe a certain thing. So you just have to be careful. And that's the crazy part of the, not, not the crazy part, this is the, the risky part of NFTs is that, you know, there is a strong financial incentive to do one through another. And it is in sometimes in their best interest to be uh, not transparent. So there is some mm -hmm. data asymmetry there so that you know more than they do, so you can make more money. And so um, you have to be careful. And I think that what Thap is saying is correct. And I think from my perspective, and I miss this point, my belief is I think that people want, in general, people want the right things to happen. People are inherently good is my basic premise. And I think that my hope is, and my sort of style in the, the community I put in is that I want the people to believe that because it is open, because it's more democratized, they have a choice on which leaders succeed in this space. So who you support, who you back up, who you rally behind is who will end up being, quote unquote, your senators, your representatives within this space. And you want those representatives to be people that are good actors. Uh, and so I hope that as people look at, you know, different collectors and they just don't go for the money or for the sale, but they go for people that are good leaders and good actors in the space to create the future they want. Because if as citizens or as people within the community, if you choose the, the wrong leaders, they will lead you down a path where it's not going to be transparent and it's not going to be, the intent's not going to be clear and you won't know what's going on. And so as much as it may feel like it's the bigger players and the whales and the whatever that are doing it are controlling it, I think it's early enough and small enough that you can pick your leaders today as to who you want to succeed in the space and make sure that they succeed. Because I don't think any individual in a space will succeed without the trust of the community. So, yeah. and that's something where we just have to build that up over people and realize you have much more influence and power as a group, as a community to change the future right now because it's small. Uh, and so there is a, I want to instill that belief that they have that power and that they have that influence to shape the future. Because if they don't like what I'm saying, they could easily say, I'm not following Chikai anymore. And if I'm a bad actor, they shouldn't. At least I don't think they should. Uh, and so I want people to believe that part and that will help us get to where we need to for, you know, dealing with all these issues because I, otherwise we'll have to create these centralized infrastructures that say, here are the rules, here's how you're supposed to do it. And here's, I guess, more regulation, basically. The more bad actors- Okay, we're back to square happen. one. <laughs> yeah, we're going back to more centralized regulation. So the only way we get to that future is if people feel empowered and they and they put their- support behind good actors i think it's a yeah. very difficult thing i'm not sure if there's been success cases in this area but at least for the one-on-one -on -one world <laughs> which is going to be a small world relative to the world of nfts i want it to be true just for the one-on-one -on -one world if there's just one area i want to be true for i just want this to be true for one-on-one -on -one art world everywhere else will be whatever but like the one-on-one -on -one art world i want it to be like that that's my dream i don't know if it's going to happen but that's my dream yeah. You know what? I want to, as we wrap this up and bring this to a close, because we want to want to stay to our commitment to keeping this around an hour. Um, the one final question I want to throw out at both of you, and Daph, maybe you can take this first, just the, the, you know, a general question. The biggest issues, obviously, the context of this conversation is around curation, but, you know, the biggest issues right now, whether it's curation based or other, that you feel like are facing artists in the NFT space and on the other side of that coin facing collectors on the, in the NFT space. Well, I think um, um, this, this conversation sort of happening partially to answer that, right? Because I think for me, the, one of the biggest challenges for, for, for artists that I hear and complaints I hear is um, how do they get found out, right? How they, they get um, discovered, if you will. Um, and people are complaining about having spent a lot of time on Twitter uh, and the interactions on Twitter. Like there was somebody yesterday who had a, a thread on, you know, how the interactions on Twitter are no longer sort of authentic because everybody's trying to game the algorithm. And um, so I think it's just for, for artists, um, yeah, finding the right venues and the right way to, to expose their work without 
having that detract from their time uh, spent making art. Right. I think that's yeah. that's probably one of the biggest challenges. Uh, and likewise for collectors, it's, you know, uh, it's trust on what you're getting. Right. Um, and I think it's like, you know, what am I, you know, finding out good things. Also, you know, there have been cases where collectors have bought art and turned out the art was from somebody else. So there's also another point about curation we didn't talk about, which is verifying right? Mm-hmm. That, mm-hmm. That, that there is authenticity. There's, you know, because of course, once it's in the blockchain, there's provenance. But what happened before that, you know, uh, sometimes you need to check, right? So well, in fact, you yeah. should always check. Um, so I think for, for collectors, yeah, again, filtering all that, uh, I think is a big challenge. Um, and we'll we'll continue we'll continue this conversation on Thursday because you know that's how we're going to roll this. Um, I want to I brought uh, I invited Studio Pyman to to come on stage. Um, they had their hand up, so yeah, I wanted to you know throw the mic at you. Did you want to join in the conversation and tell us your thoughts on this whole curation versus AI versus humans and other? Yes, thank you, Frederick. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this stage. Yeah, it's a fascinating conversation. I mean, when I hear you guys talk about collectors and artists and curators, I feel like I wear all those uh, three hats uh, and feel very privileged to be able to do that with this Web3 NFT, you know, movement. So, uh, and I think that it's just, you know, uh, you, 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 you know, you have to do your own uh, research and you have to make sure you do your research before you trust. So trust before you, you, you know, verify before you trust. Right. And then yeah. mm-hmm. as far as curation is concerned, I think that, um, you know, I, I appreciate what, uh, Shikai was saying that it is a difficult, uh, work, but I have the fortunate, uh, you know, opportunity to work with, you know, 10, 11 uh, amazing artists and curators that have been uh, in the NFT scenes from the... Oh, I think we may have lost him. Yeah, he may have gotten broke. But we got over 500... Uh, we got over 500 artists that, um, you know, participate in our uh, art shows from Miami Bitcoin Conference to NFT NYC and beyond. But, you know, it, it, it's a big responsibility. But our motto is that we want to be, you know, going away from the traditional way of gatekeeping and want to bring in any artist that fits the show and the theme, uh, no matter if you have uh, one follower or you have, you know, a million followers, right? So um, yeah. it's all about, like, you know, you know, going around and finding different, discovering different communities and finding different ways to show your artwork. But there are uh, curators out there that really do care about uh, exposing and spotlighting brilliant artists that don't get to be seen in in, in the old Web 2 uh, world. So, yeah, I just wanted to add that. And again, thanks. And uh, Shikaya, I'm in the Bay Area, too. So, yeah, I love to connect with you. I think you're a friend of my uh, buddy. Uh, uh, I saw you guys taking some uh, pictures the other day in the city. Um, so, yeah, anyway. Oh, yeah. Is it rough? Yeah, rough, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I discovered yeah, you stuff through, through it, him. Yeah, pleasure. Yeah, d- totally. <laughs> you know, like curation work, uh, it's, uh, it's like a selfless act that has to come to you naturally. And for me, I, I'm an artist, and I'm totally proud of my work. I've been in the industry for over 25 years, and but it's so much easier for me to uh, spotlight other talents. And this is like a very natural, it has to be a natural and organic. And I, of course, I appreciate what you said earlier about the uh, curators should get paid too, uh, because all this time we've been really doing uh uh, curation as volunteers and so but i feel like that that definitely con- compensation should be there in some way because you know it, it's hard work so yeah anyway thank you again and pleasure meeting all of you and look forward to future com- conversations no absolutely yeah i think what we'll do is we'll very 
let's definitely continue this conversation a little bit on Thursday because uh, there's a bunch of questions I wanted to throw at, you know, just kind of put out there in the universe. One of them is on the on the curation topic, where it is like what are what are the analogs between curation and like you know we're talking photography right so photo contest judging right which seems very low brow versus the more high brow creation or curation but are they very similar and if so how so i want to i want to continue the conversation and talk about that stuff a little bit shikai i want to throw it to you to give us sort of the you know part of the closing words here you know your thoughts on the the biggest issues facing artists and likewise on the other side of that coin collectors for you know the, whether it's cre- curation or just general nft issues yeah i mean i'll definitely concur with Daph's sort of uh sort of uh sort of uh, observation that discovery both sides for finding artists to collect as well as artists finding their collector is difficult i do think curation is going to be i want that to be the answer i do a human curation to be the answer for that but other elements, I think, which are difficult, and especially right now, and it just points to how complex of a sort of ecosystem we're in in regards to NFTs. Is it not? It's not just about art and just paying for art, but there, we're. It's all being built upon Ethereum and the blockchain technology, and it's going through its own sort of uh, crisis and just ups and downs with Luna and like the Terra sort of ecosystem and just all kinds of stuff that is just crazy that you have to understand that somewhat, at least to be aware of it, as well as the art and NFTs and the collectors and, and that and all that sits upon that. And if that collapses or something d- d- drastic happens, I think everybody's like, what do you do? Like, I mean, some people want to get out and sell their NFT, which I've seen some big collectors with, their, with some of their stuff being uh, put out there and, you know, some artists are lowering prices, uh, depending on just to be able to uh, for to find the people to, to get it. I mean, someone was sort of noticing that about prices lowering and how do you sort of survive in this market and this down market and stuff. So I think that is another element that is can only come from people forming a community, being together as a community. Because like there are people who are very technically smart. There are people who are more economically sort of like have no more economics background than I do for sure. And by working together and sharing knowledge and sharing our perspectives, both in terms of our experiences in the space, I think will help us get through that. Because it can be very daunting and scary uh, because it's so complex. It is so hard to understand sometimes. And I'm just focusing just on NFTs and just one-on-one NFTs. And it's still a lot to figure out. Mm-hmm. So I, yeah. that's the yeah. I think is difficult because it's because if you don't know, you get scared because there's, there's fear in going to something that's completely unknown that could completely wipe you out from a financial perspective. Um, that's right. Careful. Yeah, it's like a hermit crab, right? You're gonna <laughs> you come out a little bit if you sense danger. You're going back in there. You know, you're not gonna you're gonna wait for the danger yeah. to disappear. You um, don't want the crabs right. to leave. You want them to stay around. You want them to, so you got to help them out. So. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, the prime the pump. All right, let's uh let's bring this one to an end. Thank you all for for uh, joining for this. You know, Shikai and Dap and and also you know we had Studio Pyman join in and give us some some uh, thoughts. But I'm I'm really excited to be doing these these little conversations because I think these are you know I wanted to guide these topics to not be safe conversations or overly sort of irrationally exuberant conversations about about the space that we're in but still i'm overall bullish about everything that's going on and i want to expose a lot of that cool stuff that's happening and help people understand what's happening in the nft world and and photography as it relates to the nft so i think we can do that with these uh with this new format so thank you all for coming on i want to throw it back to dab for any final Final thoughts before we show, close the room. You have any final thoughts, Dap, before we end this? Uh, just, you know, we're early. That's it. I think the main main point is I agree with everything Chikai said with the challenges, but, you know, I think we are, we're are we working through them and there's still, uh, you know, the best days of NFT are ahead of us still as I'm very optimistic and bullish like you are. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love and it. Fr- thank you, Frederick, for hosting. You've been a great host. I love the challenging questions that make you a little more deeper than normal so thank you for being a great host oh you're welcome hey i i hope i did okay this is my first one <laughs> well done <laughs> well done <laughs> you 
Pinterest. I'll get better. I'll get better I promise. Good. I promise I'll get better. Just let me do another one. <laughs> on Thursday, and I, I see Omar on the on the audience. He he'll be there on Thursday as well. We're going to talk about. Uh, well, well, we'll we'll give a preview later on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, we will. We will. All right, folks. Thank you guys for coming on, and uh, we'll see you. We'll see you next time. All right. Thank All you. Right. Take care, guys. Yeah. All right.